Hello, welcome to this UNESCO lecture on suppliers, consumers, and the global minerals supply chain. My co-presenter, uh, Judy Mathuri, and I decided that we would each give our perspectives on the global mineral supply chain, and that we'd recount some of our on-the-ground experience of actions that respond to challenges in the supply chain, which have a very different regional context. So I will be looking from my perspective, from the European perspective at the supply chain. And in the first instance, in the global context, we can consider the supply chain in terms of extractivism, a term that describes um, quite simplistically the extraction of material from the ground in one place and the trade of that material to another place where value is added to it. It's a term that has negative connotations because it describes the interface between economic activity and environmental impact. And it also describes the movement of material from the raw materials producing nations, dominantly, though not exclusively, produced in the global south and moved through various trade routes, whether they're post-colonial or rejuvenated silk route routes, to dominantly, though not exclusively, the global north, where particular um, regions are beginning to develop greater concerns about the security of supply of the raw materials into their manufacturing. So extractivism also wraps up in the concept, this idea that the centres of control are concentrated in those centres of consumption, where multinational corporations will control or decide on the actions of mining operations in producing nations. So obviously, big sweep generalizations here. But there are more ways that we can look at this supply chain than just extractivism alone. Let's think about it in terms of the rates of change at either end of the supply chain. So if we consider that those consumer nations or the end manufacturing nations are innovating continually, both for the green energy transition and to more net zero futures, more climate neutral futures, and also uh, new versions of existing technologies to maintain current business models. And so we have a rapid rate of change in demand for particular alloys, for particular combinations of materials. And that demand filters along um, the value chain, well, the, the supply chain, back to the upstream end, the mining end, where it frequently takes decades from initial discovery of an ore deposit through evidencing success to investors and to full-scale production. To prove the economic viability of a deposit is a complex, expensive, and protracted process. It's another protracted process to gain licensing in a favorable economic, legislative, and societal climate. The overall scale of mining operations and the established reporting and finance system mean that the raw materials sector does respond to demand, albeit slowly, particularly for the bulk metals required for infrastructural development and transport. And once material leaves that upstream end, it then moves and is traded around the world, filtering in to potential processing, refining, intermediate product manufacturing bottlenecks. And so the collection of challenges in the rate of response, particularly the upstream half of the supply chain, have the potential to cause real supply disruption. 
but it is perhaps the perception of that real potential that drives price volatility. So some reassurance in the way that the upstream end of the supply chain works might help enormously. We can also think about the supply chain in terms of the value increase in materials as they flow through the supply chain. <coughs> Excuse me. So the manufacturing chain from feedstock supply to intermediate product manufacturing and to end product manufacturing embodies an incremental increase in value as materials are traded many times. That requires that feedstocks are relatively inexpensive. While the manufacturers and raw materials producers are inextricably linked by supply and demand, the impact of price fluctuations on business is proportionally greater for raw materials producers than for manufacturers, since it relates to a larger proportion of their overall microeconomic model. The production of large quantities of bulk metals at low cost relative to the rest of the value chain requires that world-class mines run at high efficiency using economies of scale. They need to maximize throughput in tons per hour of material from large mines, whether it's super pits or block cave mines. And that's driven past innovations in mining practice to reduce operating costs, particularly where it relates to energy, a major cost of mining and processing operations. And so what we need is a specified low production cost where we can homogenize material going through a processing plant. So that all favors development of giant world-class mines with proven reserves that ensure an extended life of mine and an adequate return on investment. It works very well for the bulk metals. However, some of the technology metals that are used in smaller quantities are also produced by primary mining. Not all, but some. And the implication of this mining paradigm is that one, maybe two or three world class mines can produce or supply material to global manufacturing. And that concentrates production and potentially increases bottlenecking or threats to security of supply. We can also think of that supply chain as a material flow. Demonstrated here is the blue line <coughs> in this scheme produced by Julian Orwood in 2018. What we see is that there's a lot of potential to reduce demand at the manufacturing end, but it doesn't entirely equate to all the material that's needed for current applications. We still need material flows from the upstream end. And at the upstream end, we have a very high energy demand and very high emissions. So we need to think about ways of changing the mining paradigm to make it a little bit more resilient. And so although these flows are based on steel supplied by the bulk metal of iron, we can start to think about the differences between the bulk metals and the technology metals a bit more. And if we think about the tech metals, a classic example is the rare earth elements, where we can see that it started out with very niche uses becoming <coughs> used for mainstream applications and then the green energy transition. And so these are one of the technology metals that are produced by mining. So ways that we can secure access to these through the supply chain are by good trade relations, by 
reduction of demand and some substitution, though that's limited where technology metals have specialist properties. We can think about the circular economy and recycling initiatives as these products come to end of life. But most of what we're recycling at the moment doesn't have the right metal combination for the applications we read, need right now. So we can think about alternative sources, or we can think about diversifying mining strategies. So one experiment I've been involved in is a small scale mining experiment, where we recognize that the regulatory and economic system is geared towards world class mines. And we have to ask some challenging questions, whether small scale mines can be more responsive to supply shocks. If the wide distribution of small scale mines, the geographical distribution, expansion of production can reduce perceptions of supply shocks and therefore reduce price volatility. What does it take for the system, the overall economic, political, social system to facilitate wider uptake of small scale mining? And can small scale mining have a lower individual and cumulative footprint than large scale mining? So a new mining paradigm is needed. And a group that was supported by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme is called IMPACT, where we looked at technological solutions to access small high-grade deposits. And we can see in the figure here, the small footprint test facility and small tailings pond with some stockpiles around it that was deployed as part of the solution. And in the background, we see a conventional processing plant under construction, which is considerably larger. But we didn't just think about the technical solution. We also thought about the value chain context, which includes technology development and procurement and the logistics, the transportation deployment and operation of these solutions. And also what human resources it takes, what training is needed, what health and safety is needed all the way through development and how the environment is managed. And the links with the local communities. So <clears throat> what did we find? We found that in the very instance we had to change the way we were thinking as we entered the project, we needed very clearly to differentiate between small deposit mining and small scale mining. So small deposits are described in terms of their geology, mineralogy, metallurgy, in order to engineer mining and processing solutions. Scale describes the size and complexity of the mining operations and their socio-environmental impacts. Why the difference? Because small scale operations can be used on large scale mines for project staging reasons to reduce capital expenditure at startup and to accelerate startup. And that's a very important consideration. The social scientists on the project found it very difficult to think conceptually about the challenge because the conventional definitions of small scale mining are intrinsically associated with artisanal mining. And that didn't necessarily work well in a European context. And so the concept of small scale mining was rethought initially in the European context, but then placed in the global context, where modern small scale mining is extraction from ore or mineral deposits using low impact, potentially short term and small footprint, regu well regulated mining operations at top technologies that are not usually labor intensive. 
and the approach is not limited to small ore deposits. This is in <clears throat> contrast to large scale mining, extraction from ore or mineral deposits by companies with substantial labor forces that are employed across or remote from large sites working a deposit using technologically optimized approaches to develop economies of scale. It's also different from artisanal mining in this framing, which we consider as extraction from ore or mineral deposits by formal or informal mining operations with low investment and the use of technologies that are highly labor intensive. The scale of mining can either be small, relating to self-employed status of mine workers, or large, relating to the size of the collective and or deposit. It is mainly, but not exclusively, employed in developing countries. So to think about the potential for small deposit mining in the first instance across Europe, the French Geological Survey <clears throat> defined what constitutes a small deposit for different types of commodities. And they then used an existing platform for query, the Minerals for EU database, to develop a dedicated query layer for small high grade complex deposits. And this is freely accessible for anyone to use. And the result is that a large number of mineral deposits are indicated that have potential to be investigated as small deposits for extraction. We went further and we looked at once we've identified some ore deposits, usually not always small, narrow vein steeply dipping ore deposits, which are challenging to selectively mine. How do we develop a reduced scale cutting tool and accompanying mining plan to allow us to leave as much rock in place as possible? If we take as little out as possible, we reduce haulage, transportation, we reduce the amount of material that needs sorting using this reduced scale or sorting facility. And through these two processes together, we reduce the amount of material that has to go through a downsized comminution rock breaking circuit. And generally speaking, the result is that some technologies are already available and patented. Some technologies have logistical challenges to downsizing, but can be done. And some technologies need a complete rethink because downsizing and downscale just simply incrementally won't quite work. We went further again and we thought about if we have a reduced amount of rock feeding through, how do we work a minerals processing test facility, as was photographed on an earlier slide, with this reduced throughput? And once we've done that with this modular, adaptable, movable facility, how do we have modular, adaptable facilities to ensure protection of the environment? And putting all of these processes together, we were able to do the life cycle analysis from an environmental and societal perspective and look at where all the environmental hotspots potentially are. The biggest was most certainly still energy, which is an ongoing issue for mine, the mining sector. And what we found was that the energy requirements are such that portable, mobile, renewable energy systems that are already available on the market over the midterm are economically better performers than conventional off-grid diesel power structures. So this is really very promising and there's a lot more to it, um, but I will keep it short and state our concluding comments. Our concluding comments are that 
The business case is not currently amenable to extensive uptake of these diverse mining solutions that are already accessible. But these technological so solutions are available and can be rolled out within existing regulation for environmental and responsible best practice. This is important because the environment and society are increasingly constraining the prevalent economies of scale mining paradigm. And the political, social, and economic landscape is going through a major shift presently. So it looks like the mining industry has available solutions to be able to move quickly towards net zero goals. However, the proposed technological small scale mining operations are not labor intensive. And a new contract is required by mining operations and communities to think about community resilience and the sustainability slash responsibility of mining operations. And with that, I'll hand over to my co-presenter. Thank you very much. Welcome to the second part of the session on suppliers, consumers, and the global mineral supply chain. I'm Judy Mothuri, an Associate Professor of Corporate Social Responsibility at the Nottingham University Business School and currently leading the Sustainable Gemstone Artisanal and Small Scale Mining Project in Kenya. The mining sector faces a complex nexus of global sustainability challenges. In the Sustainable Gemstone ASM mining project that I'm leading in Taitataveta, we have mapped uh, these challenges against the UN Sustainable Development Goals, capturing both the positive and the negative impacts of mining. As would be expected, the sustainability issues throughout the supply chain are numerous, complex, interconnected, and interdependent. Some are more urgent, more prominent than others. And this is not unique to ASM in Kenya. It reflects the global reality where, in, in some instances, the need to decarbonize our wider production and consumption system is an urgent issue, and in other contexts, it might be sustainable livelihoods and well-being. However, overall, the mine, minerals and mining sector continues to be on the spotlight for its negative so social, economic, and environmental impacts and consumers are demanding for more responsible products, products that are conflict-free, that are produced under conditions that respect human rights of all, including the rights of miners and mining communities to a clean environment. And therefore, the supply chain, um, you know, does not just, it's not just about cheap production of minerals in order to maximize profit, but shifting towards a more sustainable uh, sector. And this means that we have to push and drive the sector to rethink its practices along the entire supply chain uh, process. While current responsi responsible mining agenda might seem to be written with large scale mining uh, sector in mind, the artisanal miners face insurmountable challenges as they make sense of, you know, um, the sustainability and also as they try to figure out how to integrate uh, sustainability into their mining practice. In the first part of this session, my colleague Kate presented to us three perspectives of the global mineral supply chain. And she highlighted the inequalities embodied in the supply chains as materials flow from the upstream to downstream. 
She observed that the manufacturing chain from feedstock supply to end product uh, manufacturing embodies an incremental increase in value as materials are traded many times. And she argued that the process requires that feedstocks are relatively inexpensive. So I want to extend the conversation a little bit further whilst wearing a social scientist hat to examine the notion of value within the chain and the implication of this on the sustainability agenda. So what do we conceive as value and value for whom? Value encompasses both economic and uneconomic aspects. Value should not be heavily tilted towards maximizing profits for the companies, but towards a shared value uh, paradigm for all actors within the supply chain process. And I also will argue that for a more resilient mining sector, value must be reconceived beyond the narrow economic perspective. So how might we secure future mineral supplies? Supply chain refers to the system and resources required to move a product or service from supplier to customer. More often than not, companies adopt a silo approach to value increase in specific steps of the chain. So how might we view the supply chain more holistically so as to derive the most value for all actors? From where I sit, wearing a sustainability hat, adopting a value chain approach offers a powerful way to examine how value is added. Consider all actors you know, in, in that uh, supply chain that are involved along the value creation process. How these actors are interlinked? What are their roles and responsibilities? How do they influence each other? because the performance of any value chain is influenced by a much wider system that consists of various supporting functions and roles and market players who are directly engaged in business transactions. They are also part of uh, supporting organizations like governments who offer regulatory uh, directions. By adopting a value chain uh, approach, mining companies do not lose sight of the bigger picture and they are able to manage their value chain well and establish a significant source of competitive advantage. Our second figure is on the ASM gold production in Ghana and both the value chain uh, depicts multiple local, regional, national, and international prayers, numerous trade routes and interconnected hubs, and importantly, the informal mining coexists along the informal mining in a globalized economy. The gold and gemstone value chains are also distinct in their organizing, but they share a similarity in the symbiotic and exploitative nature of the value chain actors' interactions. So how might we advance a more responsible and sustainable mining sector in context of institutional voids? One way of building a sustainable mining sector is to advance supply chain responsibility where companies take into account social and environmental considerations when managing their relationship with suppliers. So social and environmental performance informs a company uh, decision across the entire supply chain. Sometimes uh, companies have this tendency to deal with their suppliers in specific, um, you know, sourcing scopes along the uh, value chain. So, for example, the end user company might pay attention to just the upward management of the supply chain, which is from the mine to the refiners. 
In fact, a lot of attention is directed towards raw materials itself by many uh, mining companies. The end user also, uh, the end user company might, might also pay attention to the supply chain from the smelters onwards, which is what is referred to as the downstream supply chain. And doing uh, this is rather fragmented way of dealing with um, supply chain responsibilities. And with responsible sourcing of minerals, we must adopt a holistic view of the entire supply chain, both the upstream and the downstream. Enforcing social and environmental standards within developing country value chains can be quite challenging, particularly those in the informal sector. Uh, we know that the ASM operate informal upstream activities as their primary value chain for many minerals. And the informality in the upstream activities is reliant on casual labor, difficulties in the supply and acquisition of inputs for mineral extraction, etc. The Kenyan government only recently legislated the sector in the Mining uh, Act of 2016. Before then, uh, the sector was considered illegal. But actually, ESM is not a problematic uh, subsector as such, and neither is it an undesirable activity to be eliminated or, or disregarded in regulatory policy making. As we know, the ASM produces a significant share of global supply chain. The report, uh, 2017 report of the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, Minerals, Metals, and Sustainable Development estimates that the ASM contributes 20% uh, of the global supply of diamonds, 80% of sapphire, 20% of gold. ASM in Africa actually constitutes a sizable bulk of mineral production. In Kenya, 60% of gemstone production is by the sector. In Ghana, we are talking of 35% of the total uh, gold production in the uh, country. So the informal and highly fragmented nature of some part of the ind gem industry makes efforts towards sustainability uh, in the sourcing very complex and challenging undertaking. So for us, the big question is how might we address informality in the ASM subsector, as well as improve ASM structures to address social and environmental impacts. I know there's been a lot of suggestions of, you know, formalization, which sometimes is considered as a silver bullet, but are there alternative forms of institutional arrangements that enables the informal uh, to work alongside the former in ways that advance shared value. As companies uh, continue to face pressures from different stakeholders to source more responsibly, they are adopting variety of management approaches to responsible sourcing and consumption of minerals. Some would be within you know, the corporate social responsibility agendas of the companies, um, others would be, you know, around supply chain due diligence programs, which ensures they, they avoid harm as they do business. And uh, these due diligence approaches uh, in the context of minerals have the tendency to focus on the upstream uh, supply chain um, and also on the social requirements and human rights. Companies are also using sustainability schemes to monitor and track supplier compliance on the basis of production data. So, for example, where a mineral was produced, the location and the process. This differs from uh, the due diligence, you know, and, and the tracking from a supplier uh, perspective. Likewise, also companies are using tracking and tracing uh, to map the path an item and how it can be identified within a supply chain. 
So tra tracking and tracing describe path direction of goods and we have the forward uh, traceability which is the tracking and the backward traceability which is the tracing. And uh, an example of this is the track and trace uh, of the track and trace is a chain of com uh, custody techniques which ensure certified uh, minerals reach the end user without being mixed in the supply chain with non-certified or illegal minerals. So in the last two decades, numerous responsible mining schemes have been established that encourage transparency and reporting, stakeholder engagement and accountability, third party verification, etc. The table by Bilham there, you know, shows uh, the sustainability schemes, which might vary uh, depending on the different types. So for example, some are certification schemes, others are standards, some target specific commodities, others pay uh, particular attention to specific socioeconomic and environmental issues, whilst others like the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance is quite comprehensive. Um, Katia and colleagues also introduced a chain of custody model as a differentiator of the schemes. Some have product disclosures, like in the case of the World Jewelry Confederation. Others have identity preservation, like in the Emerald Paternity Test, etc. Most responsible mining scheme focus on upstream tiers of the chain, but not on the whole supply chain with the exception of the aluminium stewardship initiative, which certifies activities across the entire supply chain. Few schemes also are visible in the downstream tiers of the chain and hardly any have customer facing labeling. The gemstone does not have a developed track and trace system and uh, Cartier and his co-authors suggest that blockchain revolution may provide new opportunities for traceability in the highly complex and fragmented uh, colored uh, stones industry. So blockchain, as they argue, is a digitally distributed ledger technology that supports chain of custody through a system that makes documentation tamper-proof. Approaches to responsible sourcing and consumption of minerals just mentioned uh, previously are not without challenges. They, the cost of complying with some of the standards and skips are quite high. Some due diligence processes are onerous and quite time consuming. Actually, multinationals or the large uh, scale mining, mining companies may prefer to rely on the cheaper options of monitoring through the certification of standards by third party organizations. Some standards are not well fitted to some parts of the mining sector, while monitoring and enforcement requires active engagement and it can be quite costly, especially when the value chain uh, has really large supply networks that are spread all over the place. Now, with uh, artisanal mining, it becomes really difficult and quite challenging uh, to implement some of these uh, management approaches that the large uh, multinational, uh, you know, embark on. Nonetheless, there are a number of factors that can help stimulate responsible sourcing and supply of minerals. So the standards and schemes are, are, are important. You know, they might be um, very costly to comply with, but they are important tools in addressing social and environmental challenges. Companies are also, um, they understand the importance of internalizing social and environmental objectives in their business. And they are using the power of mining technology 
data gathering processes, they are committing to research and development, and all these are enablers of progress. There is scope for greater collaboration and partnership between uh, mining stakeholders. These are companies, civil society organizations, and host communities in order to address all the obstacles uh, towards stimulating a, a more responsible sourcing and supply of minerals. The ESM operate informal upstream activities in the primary value chain for many minerals. And they do not have, you know, any obvious uh, lead actor such as a mining company who will support them to identify, address, build their capacity, uh, you know, to address sustainability in the mining activity. So to stimulate a responsible production and sourcing system, we've been working with uh, mining stakeholders uh, in Taita Taveta County for the last two years to co-produce their own solution to sustainability challenges they face. So we adopted participatory methodology, which are context sensitive, to provide a platform for the mining stakeholders to use their rich experiences and understanding to frame sustainability in their own language and together to co-create a shared vision of what a responsible and, uh, and sustainable ASM mining future might look like. So the processes enabled the miners and mining stakeholders to really challenge their own perceptions, attitudes and behaviors that are contributing to their unsustainable mining practices. Amongst many other activities, one of the uh, big uh, one that was established was a multi-stakeholder dialogue forum which was launched to foster collaboration among previously antagonistic mining stakeholders. The uh, Dialogue Forum is quite an innovative platform that creates an environment to promote core values of inclusion, openness, dialogue, trust, and togetherness. And it has really enhanced the uh, miners' agency in the governance of the artisanal uh, mining sector, as evident in their desire to develop their own solutions to the sector's challenges. And one of the key outcomes is uh, of the uh, dialogue forum was the establishment of a secretariat uh, that will uh, continue acting as the decision-making body uh, and monitor the implementation of the Taitata Veta Sustainable, Sustainable Mining Action Plan 2021-2025, which uh, the mining uh, stakeholders, you know, co-created together. And uh, the project continues to build the capacity of, of actors you know, um, in, so that they are able to adopt a holistic approach to sustainability in the sector. It is, uh, you know, very early days, but I believe the battle uh, is big. The battle of ideas has been won, and now it is, you know, uh, mobilizing resources so that we can begin to. Uh, continue implementing some of the um, interventions that the community members themselves uh, established. So the figure essentially captures the theory of change in the Taitata Veta Sustainable Mining Action Plan, uh, which adopts the SDG framework in developing the five thematic areas of focus that the mining uh, stakeholders identified as issues of priority to them. And it considers some of the support strategy and the core strategies uh, that the um, mining stakeholders will adopt 
and uh, the enabling environment that has to be created so that the ASM grows and expands towards a more sustainable uh, and accountable manner. In conclusion, the mineral resources supply chain can be complex. We will continue seeing stakeholder pressure for responsible and sustainable minerals. This will uh, include new legislation that will continue to push the industry to find sustainable solution. So I think sustainability should be seen as an opportunity and not a cost. And uh, companies should be able to uh, embrace technology to find new ways of improving either the transparency of the future supply chain or making sure that it uh, has a positive um, footprint. So again, there is no one size fits all approach. Sustainability challenges are unique to context to size of mines and to their mining life cycles.